evening, everyone. <laughs> My name is Dorothy Roberts, and I'm the George A. Weiss University Professor and Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Mazel Alexander Professor of Civil Rights and Professor of Africana Studies here at University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Before we get started, please make sure that you have silenced your cell phones. The Center for Africana Studies, along with Annenberg School for Communication, welcomes you to the 19th annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture in Social Justice. The Center would like to thank Penn President Amy Gutman and Pro Provost Wendell Pritchett for their generous support of this event as well as Dr. John Jackson, Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication, our co-host for this evening's program, for his generous support and partnership. We'd also like to thank April Clater, National President of Penn's Black Alumni Society, and its board for their support. Yes. <laughs> Inaugurated in 2002, this lecture is part of the university's annual celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. King. The lecture brings to campus national and international scholars and public figures who have committed themselves to social justice. Among those who have participated in past King lectures are the late Julian Bond, former chairperson of the Civil Rights Commission and Penn professor Mary Frances Berry, and actor and activist Harry, Harry Belafonte, Trans Africa founder Randall Robinson, and Afro-Colombian activist Carlos Rosero, Black Lives Matter founders Patrice Cullors and Opal Tometi, Charles Blow and Joy Reid, and last year, Reverend William Barber, along with the Office of the Chaplain and the African American Resource Center. This year, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Angela Y. Davis and Dr. Gina Dent. <laughs> they will be properly introduced by Dean Jackson soon, but let me just say that their commitment, in the words of Angela Davis, to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world is exactly the message we need to hear today. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Penn's president, Dr. Amy Gutman. <laughs> Dr. Gutman is the eighth president of the University of Pennsylvania, serving since 2004. She's an internationally renowned leader of higher education, in prominent, a prominent advocate for increased access to college, for innovation based on interdisciplinary collaboration, and for the transformative impact of universities locally, nationally, and globally. In her inaugural address, President Gutman outlined a bold and ambitious vision for the university, the Penn Compact. Penn's commitment to the three core values of the Penn Compact, inclusion, innovation, and impact, has propelled the university forward during an era of dramatic challenges and change. An award-winning scholar, President Gutman has published widely on the value of education and deliberation in democracy, the importance of access to higher education and health care, the essential role of ethics in public affairs. She's the author of 17 books, including Everybody Wants to Go to Heaven But Nobody Wants to Die, Bioethics and the Transformation of Healthcare in America with Jonathan Moreno, published last year and The Spirit of Compromise, Why Governing Demands It and Campaigning Undermines It, with Dennis Thompson, published in 2012. In 2009, President Barack Obama appointed President Gutman as chair of the Presidential Commission for, for the Study of Bioethical Issues, a role in which she served through 2016. President Gutman is the recipient of numerous honors and awards, and I'll have time just to mention a few. 
In 2011, she was named one of the 150 women who shaped the world by Newsweek, and in 2014 received the Anti-Defamation League's Americanism Award. In 2018, Dr. Gutman received the Philadelphia Inquirer Industry Icon Award and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the I Have a Dream Foundation, and that same year was named one of the world's top 50 global leaders by Fortune Magazine. Last year, President Gutman was honored with the William Penn Award, as well as the Pennsylvania Society's Gold Medal for Distinguished Achievement. She's also the recipient of five honorary degrees, the most recent in 2017 from Johns Hopkins University. Thank you, Amy, for your leadership and vision. And please join me in welcoming the president of the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Amy Gutman. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's wonderful, wonderful to see you all. Let's give it up again for Dorothy. She is fabulous. Absolutely. So it's great to see you all here. I am truly, truly honored to welcome all of you to Penn's 19th annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. lecture on social justice. We have an exceptional program tonight. It is really phenomenal. Uh, you will, it will be introduced by our exemplary dean of the Annenberg School for Communication, John Jackson. I am introducing the introduction, but I had to be here basically to say how thrilled I am that we are in store for a conversation with two distinguished visitors, professors Angela Davis and Gina Dent. Um, let me just say that I had the privilege last November of attending the most moving memorial service for the greatest author in my lifetime, uh, Penn Honorary Degree recipient and dear friend Toni Morrison. Yeah, at which her... <laughs> and it was at that memorial service that her dear friend Angela Davis spoke. And I have to say, when um, the convener of the memorial service uh, announced the speakers at the memorial service, uh, and Angela's name was mentioned, there was just an amazing, amazing uh, welcoming of Angela, as we heard here uh, this evening. And um, from that incredibly memorable experience, I know that everyone here is in for an eye-opening conversation tonight. Opening eyes and ears, moving hearts and minds, prompting understanding and action against social injustice, that has been the intent, the intent of this lecture since in its inception. And the two people who, from whom you'll hear this evening have dedicated their lives and careers to that very, very important goal. So let me just say something in introduction, um, invoking Toni Morrison, who famously wrote, stop picking around the edges of the world. She wrote, take advantage. And if you can't take advantage, take disadvantage. Now that's a very Toni Morrison thing to say. Toni was urging everyone who resonated with her message to engage. Engagement, undeniably among the greatest exemplars of engagement against injustice, was the man whom this lecture is named for, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Among the most familiar refrains that we hear at this time of year from Dr. King's life are, I have a dream, I have been to the mountaintop, and so on. Uh, excerpts from letter from a Birmingham jail. But there's an occasion far less often recalled on which Dr. King spoke that even more fittingly is important to remember tonight. 
It occurred just three weeks before he was assassinated. It took place not in the South, linked arm in arm with brethren fighting for civil rights. It took place in northern all-white Gross Point, an enclave of wealth and privilege in Detroit. Before an audience of more than 3,000 in the auditorium of Gross Point High School, Dr. King spoke about the other America. He began his remarks by observing, I still believe that freedom is the bonus you receive for telling the truth. Freedom is the bonus you receive for telling the truth. Not everyone in that audience agreed. About 150 had come to protest, to disrupt, and if possible, to prevent Dr. King from speaking. Jeers and screams and shouts of traitor came from the audience. Later that evening, in a press conference, Dr. King said he had never faced such hostility in an indoor event. Things came to a head when, from his prepared remarks, Dr. King decried an unjust, ill-considered, evil, costly, unwinnable war at Vietnam. A man leapt to his feet in protest. Dr. King invited him to come forward and to speak. My name is Joseph McLaughlin, U.S. Navy, said the man, and I fought for freedom. I didn't fight for communism, for traitors, and I didn't fight to be sold down the drain. Dr. King's response resonates so strongly today. He replied, I have been working too long and too hard now against segregated public accommodations to end up at this stage of my life segregating my moral concern. Justice, Dr. King, Dr. King declared, is indivisible. And that's when he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Tonight presents us with an invaluable opportunity to think closely about what is going on in our country and our world today. This will be a thoughtful evening. This will be an important evening. And I thank everyone here for attending. Please join me in conveying special thanks to the Center for Africana Studies, the Annenberg School for Communication, the Office of the Provost, the Black Alumni Society, and to everyone who has contributed to organizing this important event. Tonight's discussion will present a welcome contrast to picking around the edges. It presents a welcome chance to join together in spirit and practice to make space for sharing and understanding this important world that is our community and that we need to engage with against social injustice. My warmest welcome to you all and I ask you to please join me in welcoming the proper introducer of our guests, one of Penn's most distinguished academic leaders, a person who knows how to lead uncomfortable, important conversations, the Walter H. Annenberg Dean of the Annenberg School of Communication and the Richard Perry University Professor my friend, our great colleague, John L. Jackson, Jr. Welcome. I want to thank President Gutman for her moving and thought-provoking remarks and add my voice to hers and to Dr. Roberts in welcoming everyone here tonight for what promises to be a powerful evening. I've been tasked with the honor of reading brief bios for these amazing thinkers before their discussion begins. So I'll get right to it. Margot Natalie Crawford 
is the Edmund J. and Louise W. Kahn Professor of Faculty Excellence in the Department of English here at the University of Pennsylvania. She is the director of our Center for Africana Studies. Her most recent book, Post Black Post Blackness, The Black Arts Movement and the 21st Century Aesthetic, was published in 2017. She studies radical black imaginations in literature, visual art, and cultural movements. Gina Dent, who earned her PhD in English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, is the Associate Professor of Feminist Studies, History of Consciousness, and Legal Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she recently received the 2018-2019 Dzeki's Faculty Teaching Award in the Humanities. She previously held positions at Princeton University and Columbia University and was director of the Institute for Advanced Research at the University of California, Santa Cruz, as well as being principal investigator for the UC multi-campus research group on transnationalizing justice. She's the editor of the canonical volume, Black Popular Culture, and author of articles on race, feminism, popular culture, and visual art. Her forthcoming book, Anchored to the Real, Black Literature in the Wake of Anthropology, is a study of the consequences, both, both disabling and productive, of social science's role in translating black writers into American literature. Her current project grows out of her work as an advocate for human rights and for prison abolition, prison as a border, and other essays. She has offered courses in critical race studies, critical theory and post-colonialism, and black feminisms in Brazil, Colombia, Sweden, as well as at the Uni European Graduate School, and she lectures widely on these and other subjects. Through her, active, through her activism and scholarship over many decades, Angela Davis has been deeply involved in movements for social justice all around the world. Her work as an educator both at the university level and in the larger public sphere has always emphasized the importance of building communities of struggle for economic, racial, and gender justice. Professor Davis's teaching career has taken her from San Francisco State University, Mills College, and UC Berkeley. She has taught at UCLA, Vassar, Syracuse University, the Claremont Colleges, and Stanford University. Most recently, she spent 15 years at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she is now Distinguished Professor Emerita of History of Consciousness, an interdisciplinary PhD program, and of Feminist Studies. Angela Davis is the author of 10 books and has lectured throughout the United States and in Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, and South America. In recent years, a persistent theme of her work has been the range of social problems associated with incarceration and the generalized criminalization of those communities that are most affected by poverty and racial discrimination. She draws upon her own experiences in the early 70s as a person who spent 18 months in jail and on trial after being placed on the FBI's most wanted list. She's also conducted extensive research on numerous issues related to race, gender, and imprisonment. Her recent books include Abolition Democracy and Are Our Prisons Abs Obsolete? About the Abolition of the Prison Industrial Complex, a new edition of Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, and a collection of essays entitled The Meaning of Freedom. Her most recent book of essays, Freedom is a Constant Struggle, Ferguson, Palestine, and the Foundations of a Movement was published in February 2016. Angela Davis is a founding member of Critical Resistance, a national organization dedicated to the dismantling of the prison industrial complex. Internationally, she's associated with Sisters Inside, an abolition organization based in Queensland, Australia, that works in solidarity with women in prison. Like many educators, Professor Davis is especially concerned with the general tendency to devote more resources and attention to the prison system than to educational institutions. Having helped to popularize the notion of the prison industrial complex, she now urges audiences, including the audience we have here tonight, to think seriously about a future that's possible without prisons. 
and to help forge a 21st century abolitionist movement. Please join me in welcoming our exceptional speakers to the stage. Welcome, Gina and Angela. Since this is our annual Martin Luther King conversation, I must start with King. What would Martin Luther King Jr. do now? In 2020, in your opinion, what would be King's focus as he thought about the most crucial, the most urgent social justice issues, the most crucial work to be done now? OK, good evening, everyone. <laughs> it's really uh, wonderful to be here at Penn once again on the occasion of the annual celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. Um, what would Dr. King do now? Well, I think um, um, given his actions, particularly during the latter period of his life, evoked by uh, Amy, Goodman, Amy Gutman during her um, uh, presentation, uh, he would emphasize the interconnection of, of, of issues, just as he um, passionately spoke out against the war in Vietnam when people were telling him that that has nothing uh, to do with the end of segregation, that has nothing to do with, with racism. He, he argued that justice was indivisible. And I think now he would acknowledge the extent to which our notion of what counts as social justice has become much broader and much more extensive than it was at that time. Uh, um, Many of us uh, assume that it was possible to eliminate racism uh, without being attentive uh, to issues of class exploitation, war, um, misogyny, and now we can no longer afford to do that. And I think that uh, 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 given the fact that Coretta Scott King began to take on these issues uh, uh, it, during the remainder of her life, he would, uh, he would follow her leadership. <laughs> Let me put it that way. <laughs> oh, wow, good evening. Um, so, I shouldn't have let her go first, but um, I should know better by now. Uh, well, I think since Angela talked about what she thinks Dr. King would, would do today, I, I think I want to talk a little bit about what it means to have this holiday and to think about an individual. Mm -hmm. um, because in, in thinking about Martin Luther King and his statements and looking at how he revised statements from the 19th century and from abolitionists and invoked those in his speeches and thinking about um, uh, the words of Robert Moses, who I heard give an incredible talk on Martin Luther King Day um, some years ago, where he talked about the exchanges between Fannie Lou Hamer and Martin Luther King. And um, one of the things that Robert Moses was really pointing to was the way in which Fannie Lou Hamer was pushing and pushing to radicalize King. So when we honor Martin Luther King on this day, we do honor the man. But we also honor the movement. We also honor many people who are known to us and, and not known to us. And we do honor uh, what he was unable to complete. Uh, and that closing vision that has already been invoked now tonight, um, where it was deepened to think about anti-imperialism, to think about uh, global struggles, to think about poverty in a deeper way, 
uh, and to think about the indivisibility of justice is really um, where I think many young um, people's movements are today. And, and those are the movements that we are inspired by. And I think those are consistent with everything that I think he would have wanted. As we think about your shared work now, I think it's so important to think about how your focus has indeed been abolition feminism. And when I think about abolition feminism, I don't want to assume that everyone in this audience even knows what that means. So can we begin by thinking about those very words? What's the connection between abolition and feminism? Wow, oh, how to answer that question in a few words. <laughs> uh, um, as, um, as you know, both of us have been involved in um, activist and scholarly efforts to encourage people to think deeply about the possibility of abolishing prisons. Uh, so in this sense, abolition refers to um, uh, the state apparatus of policing and prisons. Uh, so what would it mean to live in a world that did not uh, require such uh, violent means as a putative uh, uh, solution to uh, problems of insecurity? Uh, uh, what would it mean to live in a world without uh, prisons? Um, in 1998, um, both Gina and I were involved in the organizing of a conference. Uh, the title of the conference was Critical Resistance Beyond the Prison Industrial Complex, uh, uh, which um, if we look back at the history of anti-prison organizing, we see it as a, as a turning point. Uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, at that particular conference, uh, while all of us were abolitionists, uh, um, we did not, well, those of us who were involved in the organizing were abolitionists. We did not um, think that um, at that particular moment, everyone would be receptive. Uh, uh, because there were those who had been in prison and those who had family members in prison who could not imagine living in a world without prisons. After all, what are you going to do with the bad guys? Um, and, and, you know, sometimes we would point out, well, you were in prison. Do you think you deserve to be there? Uh, well, so we've been involved in uh, almost a quarter of century of, of, of conversations. And in the meantime, um, uh, people have begun to think more deeply about uh, the uh, virtual impossibility of um, reforming the institution. Um, and where does feminism come in? Well, it's, it's interesting. It's, the beginning of these conversations actually conversations that predated our involvement in critical resistance. Uh, uh, when um, abolition was raised, uh, uh, there were those feminists who argued that we have finally um, convinced large numbers of people that gender violence uh, should be acknowledged and should be criminalized. Uh, mm -hmm. And so now you're saying you want to get rid of prisons. So how are we going to ever um, purge the world of gender violence? Uh, that was a particular moment. Uh, uh, um, in the meantime, uh, we have recognized that uh, it is rather uh, uh, inconceivable to think that incarcerating a person who has inflicted uh, violence on, um, on women or trans people in a violent situation, in, in, in perhaps the most violent institution in the country, how is that 
going to allow us to move forward in our effort to purge the world of gender violence. Uh, and so now, of course, there's Beth Ritchie's book, uh, Arrested Justice, uh, Black Women, um, Black women Subtitle. violence and the and the and America's prison nation. Black women violence and America's prison prison nation. Um, and so now we're recognizing that actually um, feminist concerns uh, provide the strongest argument for the abolition of of, of, of prisons. Uh, um, and I think I should uh, allow Gina to continue uh, uh, because I could probably go on for the rest of the hour, <laughs> but I'm gonna uh, <laughs> cede my place to you for the moment. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to send it back to you in a moment, but I, um, I, I think when, what's hard now is not so much to talk about abolition. I mean, how many of you in this room are familiar now with prison abolition movements? Yeah. So if we'd said that 20 years ago, maybe two of you would have raised your hands. So that is a, a real achievement um, of the movement that people are really thinking about what this means. But the reason we're using the term abolition feminism is because we want it to be, we want those terms to be inextricably tied together. That you cannot see a form of abolitionist organizing that doesn't think through feminism. Well, in order to do that, we really have to talk about what we mean by feminism. Because of course, there are many people probably even sitting here who still feel that feminism is an exclusionary um, form of activism, that they still see the racism and the classism residual in feminism, that they don't think of feminism as a primary um, way to be organized. Um, we disagree with that and in fact, in many ways, we believe analytically and in organizing that thinking through feminist principles is a way to actually deepen and in fact to strengthen abolition and that without feminism, abolition is much weaker. As probably everyone in this room knows, the, the use of the term abolition comes from the analogy to the abolition of slavery. And just as under slavery, those who are suffering within it often couldn't imagine what it would be like to live in another society. We are also struggling with what it means to try and think about what it would be to live without prisons. And we believe that feminism is key to helping us think through these things because it doesn't allow us, if we pay attention to feminism, to forget exactly the, the problem that Angela laid out, that the very people who felt that they were just getting recognized as being victimized and as being survivors were being acknowledged through the sentences that were being handed down to their perpetrators. We have to think beyond the idea that just at that time when that gets recognized, we're now thinking about abolishing prisons. There, is a, there was a similar kind of trajectory that I think about as a literature professor in the university when the cannon wars happened in the 80s and 90s, where um, once there was an introduction of certain kinds of texts, and Margot knows this very well, texts by black Americans, texts by others, chicken X texts and other things became important. Um, there was an idea that we now no longer had standards, we no longer had a canon. It was like everything would be destroyed. And what would we do after that? And in many ways, I feel like the conversation around abolition is very much the same, where people say, well, oh, now we're going to destroy everything just because um, you know, we're at this place. But we see it quite differently. The idea of bringing feminism into the abolitionist project doesn't allow us to forget sexual violence, but it also allows us to think simultaneously about interpersonal and state violences, and to know that we don't choose one over the other. It allows us to think about the false segregations in knowledge, where we, for example, look a lot at data on men's prisons, but often forget women's prisons because we have a smaller number of, of women in prison, which suggests that somehow those women are less important in the narrative. But in fact, if we think from a feminist perspective and look at what's minoritized in our view, what we're not taught to see, we actually find a lever that lets us see the whole system more precisely. 
So in fact, as people like Beth Ritchie, our friend, and others have really helped us see, by looking through feminism, we actually deepen the abolitionist struggle. And we see things that, for example, addressing mass incarceration only will not help us see. Could you also talk about the connections between your work in and with abolition feminism and transnational feminism? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the transnational aspect of that work? Mm -hmm. um, before moving on to um, talk about the, the um, transnational uh, framework uh, of, um, of abolition, um, I thought it might be helpful to think for a moment about um, um, a mandate uh, that we're all familiar with. It comes from the, the history of um, second wave feminism. Uh, the personal is political. Mm -hmm. uh, and as abolitionists, we take that very seriously. And we um, recognize uh, that uh, it's not simply a question of calling for the dismantling of an institution and the uh, recreation of uh, a, a society in such a way that, um, that prisons are no longer needed. Uh, uh, but, um, but we also have to think about how we have all been deeply affected uh, uh, by <coughs> ideologies of the state and how uh, in our very interactions with one another, we often carry out uh, the, 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 the work of the state. Uh, we often respond with the same kind of punitive impulse uh, that is uh, incorporated into the so-called criminal justice uh, system. Uh, and, and so, you know, abolition has a great deal to uh, learn from feminism. Feminism has a great deal to learn from abolition. And as a matter of fact, as Gina was pointing out, uh, uh, we can't uh, uh, think of them as uh, 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 discrete issues, uh, that we think of them um, uh, as joined, as connected. Uh, and so, yeah, of course, um, um, yeah, I think Dr. King would probably be very much involved in uh, the uh, uh, campaign to end the prison industrial complex. Uh, and I say this uh, because uh, eventually he began to see the uh, particular a set of issues affecting black people in this country as deeply connected to what was going on in Vietnam. Uh, uh, and if uh, indeed justice is indivisible, it means that uh, the um, abolition movement or the struggle to dismantle prisons cannot simply occur in, in one country. Uh, uh, and as a matter of fact, if one looks at the rise of what we have come to call the prison industrial complex, which is not simply about the history of prisons, it's about uh, a, a new phase uh, uh, connected to the global uh, political economy of, of capitalism. And it's about a particular moment, and we can date this to the 1980s uh, uh, when, uh, we not only uh, begin to experience uh, deindustrialization, and of course in Pennsylvania, you know what that means, uh, uh, but uh, we also uh, see the um, we also uh, see the welfare state, uh, about which many of us have been critical, uh, because it failed precisely to. Uh, respond to people's needs, uh, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it did um, it did emphasize the uh, responsibility of government to people uh, in uh, the particular countries. And now, of course, the welfare state is all but gone. Uh, uh, 
uh, we, uh, health care has been totally privatized. Uh, you know, what was considered the purview of uh, government is now uh, subject to privatization. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, when this process uh, uh, began to be felt in the 1980s, uh, uh, we um, saw huge numbers of people, not only without possibility of work, because jobs had been had emigrated to other parts of the world where labor, uh, where the labor force was cheaper. Um, and, and no welfare state to respond to those who could uh, no longer sustain themselves. And it was in this context that the emphasis began to be placed on incarceration and imprisoning people. The decade of the 80s saw this uh, vast increase in the number of uh, prisons. Uh, uh, in California, for example, there were, had been about 10 prisons, and I think the number very quickly went up to 33 uh, by uh, the mid-90s. Uh, um, and so th the US, of course, is not the only country affected by uh, uh, that process. Uh, uh, it's actually the same economic set of economic conditions that has led to migration. Uh, so one could argue that at the very same time as vast numbers of, of, of people, especially black people, uh, uh, Latinx people, and other people of color were being herded into prisons, uh, People in other countries, and we can talk about Central America here, uh, under the impact of, uh, of, 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 of this um, um, transformation in global political economies, no longer can, um, no longer can make a living in their, in their home countries. And so they begin to look to places like the US. Uh, so I think it's important to see th these processes as integrally related. Uh, um, and in that context, uh, both of us have been doing work in places like Australia. Uh, uh, we're both involved with an organization called Sisters Inside, which is an abolitionist um, organization that responds specifically to the needs of women in prison in um, Brazil. Um, and, um, we both visited uh, prisons in Sweden and uh, some years ago, and were um, were actually surprised. And we shouldn't have been um, to find that the that that even in Sweden, prisons are full of people from the global south. Uh, so if you want to find black people or or, or people from uh, South America and Sweden visit the prisons. The same can be said of the Netherlands, yeah. um, uh, Spain. Spain. Yeah, so this is, this is very clearly uh, a global issue um, to which the issue of, um, of migration, immigration, should be linked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say about the need to think transnationally, but as Angela has mentioned, we can't not think about it that way because we're talking about global capital. So fundamentally, to be an abolitionist, you have to be thinking and paying attention to capitalism, which often gets left out of the conversations about mass incarceration and I think to our detriment. But um, as she mentioned, we've, we've spent time um, going to uh, prisons wherever we can when we travel, Argentina, and we've tried to get into prisons in Brazil, and we've been in prison in South Africa. Um, and, and one of the things that I've often been focused on is the way in which prisons are a colonial legacy. So when we talk about the origin of the prison, and mm. many people have read Michel Foucault and, talk, and understand the prison as a reform from corporal punishment, and the fact that the US was considered to be the um, paradigm 
uh, creator um, by uh, in using the prison system um, rather than corporal punishment only. However, um, we still live with the way in which the U.S. is responsible for prol proliferating um, styles of imprisonment. So, for example, when we were doing the critical resistance organizing back in the 90s, there was a prisoner strike in Turkey. And one of the reasons for the strike was that um, they, they were getting what they call F-type prisons or the kinds of prisons that um, allow uh, the kind of panopticon-like prisons where people can be viewed um, from so many different directions. And also, we're getting um, the style of cells where people were very isolated. So um, in the United States, we often talk about the needs for privacy and wanting to have your own space. But in many parts of the world where we travel, and especially talking to people in prison, people do not want to be isolated in their cells. And so the introduction of American style prisons is, was not welcome and in fact uh, people were really um, struggling to make sure that they were able to remain connected to others while they were inside. I mean there are many other ways in which uh, democracy of course gets defined as a US product and it's even more ironic <laughs> today but it's been ironic forever. <laughs> uh, and the idea that as de Tocqueville said um, that democracy um, democracy in America was largely about the idea of um, the prison is part of what we're always mm -hmm. thinking about. But when you look at it from the 21st century, um, parts of the global south are uh, endeavoring to build up prison systems precisely to become either through structural adjustment programs or through other means, um, uh, you know, comparable to uh, the, what we call the developed nations. And so the struggle against the prison industrial complex has to be a global struggle. But it's also important that we think about it strongly here because of course we are spreading so much of the knowledge about prisons and how to build them and how to make them um, as uh, horrible as they are right here. Yeah. So what about Palestine? Has your social justice work in Palestine added new dimensions to your understanding of abolition feminism? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And in what way? Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, um, Gina and I were a part of a delegation um, in 2011 of um, indigenous and women of color feminist scholar activists. <laughs> I think I got it right. <laughs> that was right. <laughs> um, to a delegation to Palestine. Um, in which uh, we had um, scores of meetings. We traveled throughout the country. We saw the university. Uh, uh, we, we, we also uh, uh, met with uh, elected uh, representatives. And in some of the meetings, some of the large meetings, um, someone would ask the question, how many of you have been to prison? And almost everyone would raise their hands. Um, but it, it wasn't so much the fact that uh, 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 prison was a fact of life there, much in the same way that it is in black communities in this country uh, that, um, that um, struck us. It was uh, also uh, the extent to which carcerality had been extended to uh, the entire so-called free world. And that, as a matter of fact, uh, with, uh, with all of the, 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 the checkpoints uh, and uh, the presence of the military, uh, it, uh, people in Palestine uh, argue that Palestine is the largest open air prison in the world. Awesome. So it made us think about, uh, think differently and more deeply about many of the reforms that have been proposed in, 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 in this country. Uh, and you know about the electronic bracelets, uh, right? Electronic um, ankle bracelets uh, uh, and, and other ways of extending extending the purview of the prison uh, to ever 
larger areas of society. So we became especially uh, concerned uh, with that, particularly because, um, as you all know, uh, whenever we talk about prisons, and those who are, who are concerned about what's happening inside almost inevitably capitulate to the notion of prison reform. I mean, we all do it, am I right? Um, and as a matter of fact, I don't know how many times I've been introduced as a prison reformer, and I have to say, no, <laughs> I am not in favor of prison reform, uh, which isn't to say that I'm not in favor of changes that will benefit those who are currently in prison. Um, but if one looks at the entire history of the institution, and I'm gonna again um, evoke uh, Michel Foucault that um, Gina spoke about, whom Gina spoke about uh, a few minutes ago. And, and he argues that the very history of the institution itself is a history of the reform of the institution. <laughs> and so as a matter of fact, Reforms have served to strengthen and render more permanent the institution of the prison. And this is precisely why we argue that an abolitionist stance uh, allows us to um, acquire a greater vision, allows us to uh, imagine different um, modes of justice and, and, and ways of addressing harm, but also uh, uh, calls upon us to think more deeply about the reasons for the, for the fact that the US incarcerates more people than any other country in the world, more people um, uh, per capita, uh, more people um, um, in terms of numbers, uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, and has offered um, the institution of the prison to the world. So Palestine has been really um, helpful to our movements here, but at the same time, we feel a responsibility to uh, join in the solidarity for freedom in Palestine. As a matter of fact, just injustice anywhere is an assault on justice everywhere. Palestine has often been the exception. Yes. And what we're arguing is that um, Palestine deserves justice as well. I agree with all of that. Um, <laughs> and I will, I will add that um, Angela talked about, I think it was me, I, I would ask, you know, how many people have been in prison or known someone, and everyone would raise their hand in Palestine. But the reason for asking the question was actually to talk about the future of Palestine. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that we really, I think, learned from working internationally, and we just came back from South Africa a couple of weeks ago, and, and that's fresh in my mind as well. And they're having a very serious problem there because during, under apartheid, when people were incarcerated, the community didn't create such a stigma for those people because everyone understood mm. that the use of the prison was political. The same thing is true in Palestine. Everyone there understands that the use of the prison is political. You can see it everywhere. But what happens when you have so-called freedom? Mm -hmm. What happens when you have independence? What happens when your state becomes recognized? Then what's the function of the prison? And the presumption is often that, as it was for friends of ours who were involved in the government in South Africa, that the use of the prison would decline, that it would eventually fade away and become an unnecessary mm -hmm. institution. But what we've observed from all of our travels and from US history is that the more prisons you build, the more you'll fill them. So you have to figure out how to be organized to think, even in a time where people are offering us, and this is true for, especially when we talk about African Americans in terms of mass incarceration, 
Um, we we, we're looking often at ways to decrease uh, criminalization and decrease the numbers of black people specifically going to prison. But that is a very, it's too myopic an approach. Because what we really need to be thinking about is why those, uh, like the First Step Act, why those, why those small reforms, and we're gonna use that in term intentionally, are really helping us, or whether or not they just prevent us from thinking about more radical solutions. So a lot of our work internationally is about having deeper um, conversations based on transnational um, movements where we're strategizing about how to deal with all of the different invitations to think about reform, or all of the different ways in which prison abolition seems like it can be something left on the back burner. I mean, we all understand this from US history, looking at the choice between gender and race, for example, in the 19th century, or looking at all the different kinds of compromises that are, that are made. And around prison abolition, we can't make this kind of compromise. We have to start to recognize that we need to get to the roots of uh, the problem. And those roots require us to look globally and look at capitalism and look at the forms of democracy that we are claiming serve all people. Shifting gears a bit, but I think still thinking about abolition feminism, I wanna honor a question that quite a few of my students really want me to ask both of you. <laughs> it's about Black Lives Matter. Oh. And I think their interest, honestly, Jean and Angela, is they wanna, they wanna know how this most current movement, of course, how it both connects and differs from movements, from earlier movements. So what do you wanna say? What do you wanna share? What's most on your mind about Black Lives Matter? Mm -hmm. Well, the emergence of, of Black Lives Matter, uh, and this is usually dated uh, through 2014, and the Ferguson protests, uh, mm -hmm. right, uh, uh, has um, helped to really transform um, not only the way we talk about race in this country, but also in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, uh, I, 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 I'm so uh, glad that I got to witness this most recent moment uh, in the development of, 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 of black movements. And it makes me recognize how, um, how incredible it is that that black people have been struggling for centuries and refuse to give up. <laughs> I mean, this is just, you know, when, when you think about it, when you think about the fact that, that uh, when uh, Africans were first brought to this part of the world, to the Americas, uh, uh, and um, engaged in, in slave uprisings, uh, often assisted by indigenous people. And again, I don't think it's possible to uh, talk about black history without also talking about the history of indigenous people in this country. Um, so, um, yeah, um, the 1917 um, silent protests organized by uh, the NAACP in, in, in order to respond to the riots that had happened uh, in, in, in places like East St. Louis. Uh, uh, white riots. Hmm? The white riots, that's right. Yes, yeah. yeah. Just in case. <laughs> the riots against black communities. Uh, uh, yeah, I have to remember that because when, whenever you say riots, Riot, you they assume think us, it's yeah. black people rioting, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and, 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 and then, of course, uh, the emergence of um, what we call the civil rights movement. And I still have a hard time calling, calling that movement the civil rights movement. <laughs> uh, 
because I know that people call the movement the freedom movement. They didn't call it a narrowly constructed civil rights movement. Civil rights, of course, constituted a very important element of that movement, but it was a larger movement for freedom. Uh, and uh, you know, one of these days, uh, we'll correct that. Uh, <laughs> maybe today. <laughs> yeah, maybe today. Maybe today. Um, so I, I, I think that, um, that it's, it, we should really be thankful to you know, all of those who came before us uh, for creating new terrains of struggle. Uh, just as Black Lives Matter created yet another terrain, as there will be more terrains in the future. And I think that uh, it helps us to imagine ourselves on a continuum that not only extends centuries um, in the past and includes the Haitian Revolution, for example. I don't know how we could ever talk about uh, black liberation without evoking the Haitian Revolution. And it will extend, I assume, many years into the future. Um, where were we? Black Lives, black Matter. Lives Matter. So many things to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, before I answer that, uh, one way of thinking about it, because you, you're really making me think about the way in which we historicize. And, and, and um, I wanted to just say that when we were organizing for critical resistance, it, it's surprising, but actually when I look back to the organizing committee, it was like 30 or something people. Um, we had indigenous organizers, we had trans organizers, we had, there were a lot of issues incorporated into the organizing committee that are often left out of the, like, the idea of what that conference and that movement really is. And, and so we're always trying to put those things back in, but, but I, I think that's really important because it, it shows you that Black Lives Matter and its form of organizing didn't come out of just nowhere. That in fact, what we're often having to do is build new movement, movements that are pulling on the strands that we have historically forgotten uh, of past struggles. And so it's, it's one of the reasons that on Martin Luther King Day, we also want to talk about the other kinds of movements around, you know? The, the King holiday, yes. as much as I, you know, am happy that it exists, it was also a compromise, right? It's something that was acceptable to acknowledge in the wake of someone who is gone. But what we also need to talk about are all the radical um, movements and people who were organizing, and, and Black Lives Matter, really um, comes from, uh, when you think about the people who are the non-founder co-founders, mm -hmm. um, you know, they come from doing um, organizing around um, domestic labor mm -hmm. and um, in, uh, immigration and so immigrants' rights and, and other, so um, even when you just name Opal Tometi and Alicia Garza and, so and you Patrice don't, you, colors, yeah, yeah, and Patrice, uh, colors, you don't end up with, and the, working with the bus rec, uh, union, you don't end up with just a simple, no. narrow, black, in a kind of a nondescript way. You end up with a really deep um, uh, weaving of issues together intersectionally that, that really um, mean that that movement is building on prior movements and yet introducing things that are um, important in a different way now. The feminist um, way of thinking about leadership, the leaderful movement, mm -hmm. uh, so that we're not only focused only on one person and we're not, um, we're not targeting only one person, uh, that everyone's responsible and can contribute, but also thinking about peace in a different way. Um, not just being nonviolent, but thinking critically about what gets called violence and who gets to have the label of being nonviolent. Mm -hmm. Um, these are all, I think, contributions of the moment of Black Lives Matter, and, and they are not inconsistent with the hundreds of years of our history, mm -hmm. but they are pulling different strands of that history forward. Yeah, and I, if I could just add something, um, Gina, I think it's the point that you made about um, um, people uh, from different communities uh, uh, being deeply involved in the black movement. Uh, you know, we, 
when we talk about the black movement, there's often the tendency to assume that you're only talking about black people. But as a matter of fact, the black movement, as it has evolved over centuries and centuries, has always involved people from other communities. Uh, or countries uh, like Palestinians who've been so involved in the black movement. Yeah, and I mean, even in, 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 in the Ferguson uprising, uh, the protesters, mm -hmm. there were um, uh, Chicano Latino protesters, there were actually Palestinian American protesters uh, who went back and, and continued the protest every day for, uh, um, for months. Uh, and, and when you know, we think about people like um, 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 I'm thinking about um, uh, Yuri um, Koshiyama. Koshiyama and uh, Batita Martinez and people who are not uh, black, but who have made contributions to the black movement uh, uh, in, 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 in very profound ways. Uh, uh, and I think this is why uh, when, when we say black lives matter, uh, we're not saying that only black lives matter. And it's so interesting, the, 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 the you know, popular logic in this country, the way people think, uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, how, how many of you have heard a response to Black Lives Matter? It's, no, all lives matter. <laughs> when you say Black Lives Matter, you're not <laughs> excluding anyone. As a matter of fact, what you're saying is that if ever black lives were to truly matter, then all lives would matter. And, and, and so I think that um, in, in celebrating the birthday of Dr. King, and, I, um, and although you might argue that it was a compromise, it was a struggle itself. For right. years and years we fought to Black celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King. And, um, um, states, whole states were boycotted, you know, as a result. The Super Bowl was moved. Uh, uh, and, and so that in itself, Stevie Wonder wrote his amazing song, song that, that we all know. That's our birthday song. <laughs> so the struggle itself is an, is, is an integral um, part of um, the struggle for black freedom. But Dr. King stands in for all of those uh, whose names we do not uh, um, often uh, pronounce, or those whose names we do not know. And since Gina mentioned the fact that Alicia Garza works with the Domestic Workers Alliance uh, uh, and, and um, Recent um, scholars have, uh, like uh, Premla Madison, has written a book on domestic workers and social justice. Uh, I think it's important to point out that what we call the civil rights movement is a movement that would not have existed without the contributions yes. of black women domestic workers. Yes. Uh, yes. So, you know, when I celebrate Dr. King's birthday, I think about, you know, all of those women in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, uh, who were forced to ride the bus because they didn't have cars uh, to get to their job in white community, affluent white communities, and they were the ones who refused to ride the bus. They were the reason for the success of the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott. And without them, there never would have been a catalyst for the movement. So we are now going to open up this conversation for questions from the audience. 
and Gina and Angela, you will not be surprised. There was such excitement about your visit that questions were submitted even before you arrive. Uh, but we also have questions that are going to come directly today from the floor. But let me start with one of the questions uh, or two of the questions that were collected before. So the first question I adore, what are the ways that you practice self-care? <laughs> <laughs> This is part of the new Ooh. generation. The new generation, yes. right, Gina? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a question that would not have been posed uh, 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so you get a sense of how movements evolve. Uh, um, but of course, self-care has been um, an integral element of uh, all of the movements and organizations that associate themselves with Black Lives Matter. Uh, and I think it's a good thing uh, uh, because uh, if we don't take care of ourselves, how can we expect uh, to be effective in our social justice um, advocacy? Uh, so, um, wow. Um, I, I guess maybe I'll answer and then you. You know, I love music. <laughs> so for me, uh, music is uh, being attentive to the needs of the spirit. Mm -hmm. and, and so I spend a lot of time um, listening to music, uh, involved uh, with um, uh, jazz musicians, uh, and I think that, um, that art, literature, music mm -hmm. will show us the way. Mm -hmm. uh, because we often feel before we learn how to uh, articulate uh, in uh, the, 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 the language uh, that uh, uh, we use. We, uh, so yeah, that's one way. Um, but also, um, I was going to say I have an eating practice, but then that sound, <laughs> sounded like. <laughs> but of course, I think we should all recognize our eating practices, uh, because we often eat without thinking. We eat without, without being attentive to what it is we put in our bodies and what has rendered that um, possible. And oftentimes, if we think deeply about it, we recognize the, 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 the violence, uh, the violence that is done to the earth, the violence that is done to animals. Uh, um, and, and so um, being, being, um, being a mindful eater, let me put it that way, uh, uh, I think, it's my opinion that one of the great movements in the future is precisely going to be about food. Because we're going to have to stand up to the Monsantos. We can uh, solve the climate. And, <laughs> yes. We can solve climate. And, then, and, that, helps, and that helps us uh, to feel connected to efforts to save our planet yes. and to you know, solve the, 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 the climate issues. Uh, um, I used to be, many years ago, involved in an organization called the Black Women's uh, Health Project. Uh, uh, yeah. that, uh, and there may be some, form, some members here in the audience, <laughs> yeah. uh, in the house, okay. Uh, Billy Avery, uh, yeah. Lily Allen. And, and so we learned how to think about health uh, uh, holistically, and, uh, and not simply the body, but the mind and the spirit. Uh, um, but we have to be attentive to the body. So, um, so yeah, I try to do all kinds of, I mean, I try to practice yoga. I try to, you know, exercise and do all of those things. But I'll conclude by saying that uh, all of these are generally constructed as individual efforts. Yeah, that's right. and the question is, how do we, how do we um, arrive at a collective notion of 
self-care or a notion of collective self-care uh, uh, because we are still very much uh, influenced by the capitalist neoliberal uh, notion of individualism uh, uh, and self-care, collective self-care can help us to move in another direction. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Angela about that. I mean, I think um, it's, it's important for both of us. I would say, and Margot would know this too, we're in the same field, and, and um, there was a time when many of the black women in the generation above us, yeah. were, we were losing Absolutely. at very young ages, as well as in the activist communities. So, so many of our, our uh, you know, comrades were lost really young. So, fairly early in my career, I, I um, had to figure out some other way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's not, we could talk about this and what it is to be black at work and, and what black women do, and, and we could talk about that for a long time, but I won't, since the question is on the positive side, what are we doing about self-care? Um, so yes, we do all these things that Angela mentioned, but I, I do think that um, I'm always interested in trying to figure out how not to do them in the most neoliberal way, which suggests that I need to be free from responsibility mm -hmm. to others, from uh, uh, you know, to others, and that somehow um, what I'm trying to do is get myself to a point where I don't have to struggle. People often ask us more to Angela for her longer years of, of service, but even to me, you know, why, what does it feel like to sacrifice so much? Or, and I, I, I find that an odd question, because I don't think of my life as particularly hard. Um, um, and it's because um, the struggles that we're involved with are really struggles that um, are meaningful. And so when people talk about, um, when you're talking about black people always struggling and continuing to struggle, that's also, the meaning of, of what it is to be black. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I like the idea of not struggling. That doesn't mean that each and every person should be struggling just for basic survival. But what it means is there's always gonna be some other horizon to look at. Mm -hmm. Not for myself, but mm -hmm. for someone else. And, and that, to me, is part of self-care. Right, always being aware that we are interconnected and that we are actually um, in a much larger world. And it's soothing when the times are hard. Mm -hmm. So our next question before we move to, <laughs> before we move to more questions from the audience, uh, these pre-submitted questions, this is uh, the next one that I will share. Given that this is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. lecture, it seems important that we talk about voting rights. Mm. Can you address why the vote remains such an important battleground for black people and other marginalized communities? What do you think the next few years will hold on that front? Mm. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I knew we were going to get here at some point. <laughs> um, yeah, especially now, especially at this particular moment, the vote is absolutely important. But I want to preface that by saying that um, electoral politics not always the best way to express radical politics. Um, because um, eventually, in order to address all of these complicated issues uh, uh, that we will continue to talk about, uh, we're gonna need um, revolutionary change in this country and elsewhere. Uh, capitalism is not going to lead us toward the kind of future that we want and that we want those who come after us to experience. It will not. And unfortunately, we can't uh, vote capitalism out right now. <laughs> I mean, I wish we could. Um, uh, 
Um, but having said that, uh, uh, I'll, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a story about the last election, and, 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 and maybe oh, yeah. that will, will be helpful. Uh, I, um, well, you know, I tried to register to vote as soon as I was able in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, um, in the 19, after 1965. Uh, uh, and, um, and so I always vote. But until recently, I have always voted um, for independent, like communist or Green Party. Green Party, <laughs> right? Uh, and I think the very first time I voted for a major candidate was in um, 2008. <laughs> so, so you know who I voted for then. Um, but let's fast forward to the last election in which I was extremely critical of Hillary Clinton. Um, and especially her glass ceiling feminism. Uh, because you can't expect that, that, that a couple of women who penetrate the glass ceiling are gonna transform the lives of the majority of women who need change. Um, as a matter of fact, those are the ones that are not only not near the ceiling, <laughs> but they're probably under the floor. <laughs> um, not, nevertheless, nevertheless, when I looked at uh, the, the, um, the political possibilities of that moment, I decided, and I said, that I was gonna vote for Hillary Clinton, uh, even if it meant that I had to put a clothespin on my nose or something. <laughs> but anyway, and I urged people to do the same, not because she was a good candidate, but because of the fact that, that we would have more space to organize that we would be less on the defensive. Uh, and, and then um, um, all kinds of people started criticizing me. Uh, I, uh, the Twitterverse. Yeah, in the, and, and the Twitterverse, yes. Uh, <laughs> she's no longer a revolutionary. How can she be radical? Uh, well, yeah, vote for a Democrat. Uh, but, um, but anyway. The point was that, uh, that uh, and, and interestingly enough, black women uh, are perhaps the most strategic voters mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. the, most rash, the most rational voters, uh, as they've been called. And m proportionally more black women voted for Hillary, not because they thought she was gonna lead them to freedom. <laughs> But because they thought it was absolutely necessary to prevent, what's his name? Um, <laughs> um, we don't say to his prevent name. him who will remain unnamed <laughs> from occupying the White House. Um, and. Um, and so I think that that's what we have to do with our vote today. Uh, and I hope that, uh, that everyone who is registered to vote goes out. I, you know, I'm not even excited about the, the candidates. Uh, so I want, but whoever, <laughs> let me tell you, well. whoever becomes the candidate, this time we have to vote to get, my uh, uh, niece uh, uh, asked right after the <laughs> election, why did? She's only five. And, no, she was younger than that. <laughs> Whatever. She was why like, is Donald Duck president? <laughs> <laughs> so we've been calling him that for some time now. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I mean, I'm really serious. Yes, I think yes. uh, 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 we are all going to have to drop everything yes. and do the knocking on doors and telephone calls and everything that we need to do to get out the vote. That is about our survival. That is about our future capacity to uh, continue to engage in struggles for social justice. Yeah. Um, so Angela started by saying that um, the voting is not the most important way to express your politics as an activist. And, and that's true. But it's voting and. And I think this is the problem yeah. that we face. We faced it under uh, Obama, you know, that somehow the idea was we put him in charge and then we just like relax for some years. Um, so there are a couple of things that I think are, are worth adding to this. And one is that, you know, if the franchise weren't important, then people who go to prison and other, you know, black people haven't had to struggle for, for the right to vote all these years. There would not be disfranchisement if the vote wasn't important. I, I, I once taught an African American introduction course, and uh, one of my students, who probably regretted it after he said it, said, "You know, I don't know why I have to, you know, be in education. My people struggled, and now, you know, so." And I was like, "Well, actually, um, we should talk about why the black struggle would make you see certain kinds of education as important." Not school per se, because a lot of what we call schooling now is just policing, but, but education. <laughs> and I feel the same way about the vote. I mean, Angela broke it down already, but we, we yes, we will vote for one of these people. Um, but then we also have all kinds of other work to do. I'm not yeah. sure why we get so confused about the fact that those are different things. Yes. And, you know, and there were so many ways that we could have struggled more under the last administration. But I think we're uncomfortable with some questions around leadership. So the, the final thing I want to say about this is that connecting to Black Lives Matter, um, we should talk more about what it means to think about leaderful movements. And why? Because I think it helps us to think about this crisis of not liking anyone in leadership, never wanting to be, to, to be supportive of anyone who's in certain kinds of positions. Um, we know people are not perfect. We know they're just representatives. We know, you know that they are going to not do everything we, we want them to do. But the forms of organizing that allow people to represent us and then when we hold them accountable, we seem to have lost. So um, I, I don't, I'm not looking for a perfect leader. Uh, I'm not looking for someone perfect I can vote for. I'm looking exactly to create more space for the forms of activism that I'm engaged mm -hmm. in and to be able to imagine a world where we can act differently, but we have to do that in a less repressive environment. And we haven't talked about a lot of things in this conversation. I know we talked about some, but I just want to say something about immigration. I mean, I'm dealing with so many issues with friends and, and family and, and, and students and on campuses. Um, and in general, around immigration, we haven't even talked about what's been going on on the southern border. And um, I just don't think we should leave tonight without talking about that. And we have to have mm -hmm. other people in office in order to be able to focus on a lot of these other issues. Yes. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the audience? Hello, ladies. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, I enjoyed my time here. I enjoyed the conversation. I just wanted to say a, a few things that, you know, it's a, a difference between racism and white supremacy, and I think people don't often know that, and that's where a lot of the problem lies. They see a situation happen, and they don't understand that it's just a small part of a larger issue and um, that it's I think it's wonderful that women are beginning to assume positions of power you look at the congresswomen that are in office now and uh, women who are assuming other positions such as law enforcement and here in Philadelphia we will be receiving a new uh, police commissioner which is a black woman 
and I, I wish her very well in her in her job. And because the thing is, is that amongst white men, the spirit to punish is very strong. And with the influence of women, I believe that uh, gentleness is the strongest thing, and we often forget that. But when you look around at our country, we have situations like Mississippi, and the um, okay. I'm sorry. How do you? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm gonna get to the point. How do you feel about the when we have situations such as the Amber Geiger trial, and you have a black judge who took the opportunity to hug the defendant, give a Bible to the defendant, and offer words of encouragement to the defendant when persons of color would have, I've been treated worse for traffic violations, you know. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you okay. very much, ladies. And also, let's, and remember everyone, to keep the question short, let's take two more quick questions and then Gene and Angela will answer a group of three. But remember, please crystallize your question. <laughs> Did he ask the question? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, how are you? My name is Tamara Russell. Um, thank you guys for being here. We truly appreciate your presence. Um, my question to you is, what solutions slash action, action items do you offer to the next generation that we must take advantage of? Yes. Okay, one more, one more question, and then they'll answer those three. Okay. Hi, my name is Tamara Buckner. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to ask if you believe that true revolution is possible for black Americans without violence, and do you believe that there is space for a new black militant movement in the United States? Oh, I'm trying to think. I don't know, you could just start. Okay, uh, well, um, <laughs> oof. <laughs> you know, um, it might be good that there's a black woman who's the chief of police. I don't, um, I'm, I, I don't know what impact that's actually going to have, but I think it's important for us also to think structurally <laughs> and to recognize that Racism is deeply embedded in the very structure of policing. And of course, there are those who say, who say well, um, you know, this uh, young black woman was attacked by a black policeman, so it can't be racism. <laughs> say what? I mean, I think we've begun to recognize that racism is not simply about attitudes, and it's not primarily about attitudes. It's about ongoing structures and apparatuses in which racism is so deeply and historically embedded uh, uh, that uh, um, it matters little what individuals are playing uh, uh, the role. I'll, uh, Gina mentioned that we were just both in South Africa um, uh, some years ago uh, in the aftermath of the uh, um, downfall of apartheid. There was an attack on uh, miners, black miners, the Americana, Americana miners. Some of you may have heard about this. Well, okay, the miners were black? The police who attacked them? were black, the local police commissioner was a black woman, the national police commissioner was a black woman, but nonetheless, there was horrendous violence and brutality that reflected the violence and brutality of the racism of the apartheid era. So we have to be aware of simply wanting to change the actors, but leaving the structures themselves intact. And uh, uh, the, what was the question here? About, uh, action items. Action yes. items, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
fashion <laughs> items. <laughs> you know, I don't know whether it's that helpful to talk about action items uh, because, because I think there is so much that we have to do that we have to be willing to um, uh, embrace an agenda that is very broad and a, a very capacious agenda that um, allows us to do the specific work that we're doing while keeping in mind that there is important work to, to do in other spheres. I mean, for example, um, for people who have not been involved in trans struggles, uh, you might think, well, um, that concerns a relatively small uh, minority of people. How is that going to help change the world? The same kind of argument was often made about, well, women are only 7 or 8% of the incarcerated population. Uh, doesn't that mean that the whole struggle against incarceration is, is a male phenomenon? Uh, uh, but feminism helps us. When I say feminism, I'm not talking about <laughs> Hillary Clinton's feminism. <laughs> You know, I'm talking about anti-racist feminism, anti-capitalist uh, feminism, uh, transnational feminism. Uh, and, and I say fem feminism allows us to recognize how oftentimes issues that appear to be relatively small can have a massive transformative effect. And, and we began to realize this in, when, when, in, in the anti-prison movement when trans prisoners began to complain about the way they were treated in prison. And once we began to take on the issue, we realized, oh my god, this gives us an entirely different perspective on the entire prison industrial complex. And it allows us to recognize how ideological work happens, how it is that, that most of us in, in, in the world were led to believe that there were only um, uh, two genders. Uh, because there are men's prisons and there are women's prisons, right? And so you see that that helps to sustain the notion of the binary character of gender, not only with respect to prisoners, but in the larger society. Uh, so that is extremely important work. Uh, um, and I can't think of a single issue that someone uh, might raise now in which I would say, oh no, that's, that's not an important item on our agenda. We have to create a capacious agenda and recognize the ways in which we are all interconnected. The you know, intersectionality uh, of the feminist notion of intersectionality is important because it emphasizes um, interconnections, inter interrelationalities. We do not have to construct hierarchical agendas. We do not have to say that this is more important than that. Uh, uh, we, we, we say that everything is important, and it is especially important now to recognize um, the rise of women. And when I use the category women, I'm thinking very broadly. I'm including trans women uh, as well. Uh, uh, so that when, um, well, I, I, I see it's zero now, so, <laughs> so I'll save that for the next time. <laughs> So that uh, Gina will have the opportunity. So I won't take all, there's too much. So um, I just want to say a couple of things to follow on. Because the action item thing, I, I, I know where that comes from. And I, it's important. And I want you to do what you, you believe is urgent. The thing that I feel is hard now is that we feel we have to do everything. So it's very hard to focus. It's like that problem of multitasking. Um, what, what I think, you know, thinking about the King era and a different time where organization was different, where the Communist Party had a role, we never talk about that when we talk about, so, you know, mm -hmm. where there was actually a party organizing globally to get people to think and, and actually had a methodology for getting people organized and working on things. We don't have that anymore. 
Um, we also live in what my students taught me to call, you know, cancel culture, which I, I, um, I'm really worried about because when one person's working on one thing and then someone else chimes in, it's, it's very, very competitive. Mm. And then people get afraid to do the work they really need to do. Mm. So I'm not answering your question, but what I am saying is that, um, is that there are so many things. We've mentioned climate, we've mentioned trans issues, we've mentioned you know, immigration, we've mentioned so many things. Um, but what, it, what I think was really required is figuring out how to be respectful, coordinated, and not believe that each of us individually can achieve those things. So that, I think, is really hard now, to be able to be satisfied with the work you're doing such that you can continue to do it, and where you can respect the people around you doing it, and where you can then figure out how to build effective coalitions with other people doing other work that is necessary to the work you do, but it's not the same. Because when we try to just all do the same thing, mm -hmm. we're just spinning our wheels. And I, I just feel like in this political moment, we've got to be more generous to each other. And, and that's part of the voting thing. And then also figure out, well, how are we leaderful, but also how are we um, going to be patient that maybe we won't each individually be recognized for the things we're doing. I'm, I'm sorry to say that I think one of the things that's hindering us is that too often people want the credit very early for doing things. And the truth is we've lost many more people than we could bring up here on this stage. Yeah. It's not good news, and I'm not trying to you know, be depressing, but I want to say that that is the nature of struggle. So knowing that it's just the daily, daily doing it wherever you can, whatever you can, and then that is all important, yeah. is actually also, back to self-care, I think important for self-care. Yeah. So make your action items the ones that you can accomplish. Thank you. you know, uh, I, I was just thinking about a conversation I had with Nina Simone many years ago. Oh, she's gonna pull that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, and she, when she came, she came to visit me when I was in jail. Oh. And she was concerned that she did not know yeah. enough. Uh, and as a matter of fact, she saw, you know, I had a lot of books in my cell, and she's, she was able to come um, into the cell itself. She brought me a balloon, uh, <laughs> which I kept uh, for the rest of my uh, uh, imprisonment. But she said um, she was concerned because she did not feel that she knew enough. And I said to her, you know, your music does more to persuade people to struggle than any book will ever do. So it wasn't a question of saying what is more important than the other. Everything is important. Uh, and everybody's contribution is important. And, and since we didn't answer the question about violence oh, or, or yeah. new movements, um, that, that would take a really long time to answer in a serious way. But I'll just pull on something I already said about what's called nonviolence and what's called violence and, and bring it back to Palestine. I think one of the most profound meetings we had in Palestine was around this question of how Palestinians are always labeled violent mm. and then incarcerated just for their existence. Yes. Um, and so it depends on what we mean by violence. Sometimes what is perceived as violence in my body is just by going about my business. So um, violence is perspectival and we need to think about it in relativistic terms. But when we're talking about movements and what we need to do, since we're talking you know, about Martin Luther King and about the freedom movement, uh, then we also have to talk about strategies that suit each particular moment. And we're, with the state of surveillance, the state of uh, the arsenals, that, the military arsenals that local police stations have, um, it would be irresponsible of me to say, okay, we just need to you know, uh, it, you know, know that what's ha hitting us is so violent, we need to fight mm -hmm. back. We won't survive on those terms. Um, also, we have to recognize, and that's why I mentioned the Communist Party a few minutes ago, the forms of international organization that supported people being organized to, for self-defense. 
we're not in a position to have that support anymore the way we did before. And that is consequential. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say, you know, having come from Palestine and, and had that discussion, that um, I, would, I will support people who are labeled violent when they are struggling for freedom and struggle, for example, as um, Nelson Mandela was called a terrorist when I was growing up, and now he's considered a beloved person yeah. in the world, we know that these are just characterizations that power makes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I also want people to understand that um, Black Lives Matter has taught us a lot about the nature of violence and the effects that violence has on ourselves in our communities. So when we think about prison abolition and abolition feminism, we are talking about trying to figure out how to manifest different ways of being together in this world. And for me, that matters quite a lot. And let's not forget that the most pervasive form of violence in the world is gender violence. <laughs> Let us not forget that. Uh, um, and romanticizing violence um, can lead us in, 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 in directions um, that uh, will be less than productive. Uh, uh, I mean, I think, yeah, we, we have to be willing to defend ourselves. But what we're really working toward is a new world. And if we spent more time trying to figure out where we think we're going, where we want to go, uh, uh, then, then on the, the methods that we use, then I think that uh, we will be more equipped to you know, walk into that new revolutionary space. Uh, um, and I, I'm saying this having come from South Africa, uh, where people there are talking about the fact that the focus was too much on the actual um, um, military campaign against apartheid, and not enough on the world they wanted after they won. Focusing too much on the methods can often remove our attention from what we want when we win. Yes, 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 yes. And that's what we should be talking about. That's what we should not forget. And that is what needs to be transmitted from one generation to the next. Yes. I hate to say it, but we do not have more time for questions. But it is now my honor to present Gina Dent and Angela Davis with the MLK Lecture and Social Justice Award. <laughs> and I want, and let me say to the people who didn't have the opportunity to pose your questions, I'm, I'm so sorry that um, I know you probably had really interesting and exciting uh, questions. Uh, so uh, maybe, why don't you email yeah, them? Yes, send them, uh, send them to us, and we will send yes, them to Gina exactly. Dan and Angela Davis. Let me read uh, the words on this award. The inscription reads, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture and Social Justice Award is presented to Gina Dent, to Angela Davis, for your tireless and unyielding okay. commitment to social justice. And the final words in the inscription are, the moral arc of the universe bends at the elbow of justice. Oh, Those okay. quotes That's are from nice. Dr. Yes. King. Yes. Thank you all for coming, and let us end with King's own words, King's own words that are really a guide to movement as we walk out. Remember his words, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Everyone, join me again in thanking Angela Davis and Gina Davis. <laughs>